In Japanese culture, there's a belief that God is everywhere. In mountains, trees, rocks, even in our sympathy for robots or Hello Kitty toys. That's a quote from Japanese composer Ryuichi Sakamoto, and I'm opening this episode with this as, to me, it resonates well with some of the conceptions that are held of Japan. It's a leading-edge technological state, with its feet firmly planted in global modernity, but on the other hand, it also has a deep sense of connection to its traditional insular past. So how did Japanese culture get to where it is today? The answer lies in foreign influences imposed and embraced in the post-war years. I'm your host David, and today we are going to look at the dramatic changes in Japanese culture that stemmed from the American occupation. This is The Cold War. Although Japanese culture changed during the Cold War era, some things remained untouched, and the snacks provided by the sponsor of this video, Boksu, are among them, as Boksu partners with 100-year-old family snack makers to deliver Japan-exclusive snacks to your door. Boksu is the perfect way to bring the taste of Japan into your home. Its snack boxes have everything from sweet to bitter to sour to salty and savory. If you're ordering Boksu for the first time, you will get the Seasons of Japan box while returning customers will be sent a new thematic box every month. We thank Boxu for sending us one of their boxes. It was so much fun to absolutely destroy them with family and friends. We like the Jaga Choco potato chips and Marugatu Kajitsu gummies so much. You can order an individual box, single month, or multi-month subscriptions starting at $36.99 per box. Auto renew with the option to pause or cancel any time. Your first box will ship out within one to two weeks straight from Japan. Ordering Boxu is one of the best ways to bring Japan into your home, so get 10% off your own authentic Japanese snack box from Boxu and save up to $47 using our code and link in the description. Don't forget that this also supports our channel. In order to understand post-war Japanese society and culture, we need to have an idea of what Japan was like before the war. Modern Japan began with the 1868 Meiji Restoration, following the 1853 visit to the previously closed islands by American Commodore Matthew Perry. That visit made the Japanese realize in shock how much the Western world had advanced and how little they themselves had moved forward. Vigorous attempts to modernize and industrialize the nation bore fruit in less than three decades. This was the first wave of westernization which swept across Japan. However, despite its modernization, Japan didn't fully westernize. Many beliefs, especially those regarding interpersonal relationships, remained rooted in pre-Meiji traditionalism. Until the end of the Second World War, Japan's characteristics could be summarized in the slogan Fukoku Koyehi or Wealthy Nation, Strong Army. Under strong leadership, the Japanese people worked as a whole to achieve the nation's goals of expanding overseas. However, the rapid change brought by this breakneck industrial revolution meant that by the 1920s, Japan was in need of social reforms that it just wasn't able to undertake. For example, most of the cultivable land was still owned by rich landholders and the zaibatsus, the industrial conglomerates. This meant that at least 40% of Japanese farmers were tenant farmers. The Zaibatsus also monopolized the markets, systematically strangling minor enterprises and using their influence to alter laws and keep workers' rights to a minimum. Changes to this system would only come with the second wave of westernization, the one that came with the American occupation forces. Determined to transform the land of the rising sun into a trustworthy and dependable ally and Asian bulwark to stand against communism, the US would radically change Japan you would probably be surprised by how little resistance the Japanese people actually offered to the political and social changes that were being imposed on them. But it becomes easier to understand when you consider that by 1945, most Japanese were tired of war, which had turned into a nightmare of constant bombing of the large cities and had culminated in the atomic bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. A large percentage of the population was also disappointed with both the government and the military, and blamed them for the calamities that they had brought upon the nation. So, responsibility for the implementation of the changes the US wanted to make lay with Supreme Commander of the Allied Powers, General Douglas MacArthur, who in the first years of the war exhibited great zeal in his task. 
In Japan, that organization was known as General Headquarters, or GHQ, and one of the tasks that was delegated to GHQ was the creation of a new constitution, which was partly based on the Constitution of the United States and would be used to achieve one of the major goals of the U.S. occupation, the demilitarization of Japan. The new constitution was drafted in 1946 and became effective on the 3rd of May, 1947. It's famous for its ninth article in which Japan formally denounces all belligerent action. Quote, Japanese people forever renounce war as a sovereign right of the nation and the threat or use of force as means of settling international disputes. To this end, the article prides that land, sea, and air forces, as well as other war potential, will never be maintained. This, as MacArthur himself stated many times, was remarkably the idea of a Japanese man, Prime Minister Kujiro Shidehara, who in his diaries said that he came up with it while on board a train to Tokyo. His reasoning was that the military had lost the respect of the people, and keeping armed forces would make the Japanese obsessed with the idea of rearming the country. Now, this was somewhat undone in 1954, as the deepening tensions between the US and the USSR led Japan to the creation of the Japanese Self-Defense Force, the JSDF. However, this first step towards a pacifist state had been made, and today there is still a small minority of pacifists who still accuse the JSDF of being unconstitutional, citing Article 9. Okay, so Japan was being reorganized and democratized in both its institutions and laws. So what impact did this have on Japanese society? Well, sovereignty was transferred from the emperor to the people, the elected diet was made the supreme organ of state power, and the judicial system became entirely independent. The once mighty pre-war zaibatsus were dismantled, making way for new corporations to replace them, and land reform was introduced, with the US administration buying large areas of land and giving it to the previous Japanese tenant farmers, while at the same time cultivating a mentality of property ownership. A reformed educational system would follow an American model and was, along with these other reforms, a major factor in the economic miracle that would follow a decade later. Economic growth resulted in advancements in both horizontal and vertical social mobility on a scale that far exceeded that of the pre-war period. In fact, the change was so radical that by the 1970s, 90% of Japanese citizens considered themselves to be middle class. Now, the traditional core of Japanese society, the extended patriarchal family, would not survive these reforms. The new civil code which the Americans introduced brought equality between the two sexes and effectively rendered the patriarchal family system that had stood for millennia a relic of the past. Instead, the nuclear model of family would become progressively more common for Japanese households. Another aspect of Japanese culture that would change was that of religion. More of an ideology than a religion, State Shinto, as it was named by the US military leaders, was a distorted version of traditional Shinto beliefs and practices. It traced its origins in the Meiji era and emphasized heavily the emperor's divine nature. The Meiji government took over shrines and the once purely religious rituals then had to serve state functions. Soon, the practice of purely religious Shinto was brought to the brink of extinction and its practitioners were forced underground. It's not hard to imagine then that in the hands of the increasingly militarized governments of the 1920s and the 1930s, this new Shinto became the perfect propaganda tool to inspire fanatical devotion to the God Emperor. All that would change in December of 1945 when GHQ issued the Shinto Directive to the Japanese government by which the state's support of the Shinto religion was abolished. This was done on the basis of freedom of religion and separation of church and state, but also served a more practical purpose. State Shinto had been Japan's propaganda machine and a major contributor to the pre-war nationalistic and militant culture of the country, and its removal would help strip that away. On New Year's Day 1946, Emperor Hirohito himself put the final nail in the coffin of state Shinto by issuing the so-called Humanity Declaration, in which he admitted he was not a kami, a physical manifestation of a god. But not all changes in the Japanese way of life were forced by GHQ. Some of them, especially mass culture and media consumption, came from the fraternization between Japanese civilians and the occupying American GIs. 
The Americanization of Japan had already begun during the cosmopolitan decade of the 1920s, with theaters and cinemas gaining popularity. This was especially common among urban youth, where faddish groups who dubbed themselves Mobo and Moga, that's modern boys and modern girls, followed the cult of fast living, or supido, that was promoted and spread by means of American movies. Department stores sold Western-style clothing that became increasingly popular to the point that even some geishas started dressing in Western fashion. However, this emerging Western-style culture remained confined to urban centers and suffered a setback in the 1930s as the steady militarization of the country and then war changed the tide of Westernization. With the arrival of G.I. Joe to the home islands in 1945, this fascination with the American lifestyle that had started in the 1920s was more than rekindled. With almost half a million troops stationed in Japan, it was impossible to not influence the Japanese public even in some of the smallest things. For example, before and during the war, it was customary for a man to walk a few steps ahead of any woman he was accompanying. But witnessing American GIs, they soon started walking side by side. The occupation forces also brought with them music, films, food, fashion, and comics that captivated the local population. From 1945 to 1951, Japan had only one radio network, the Japan Broadcasting Corporation, or NHK, and its public broadcasting was under the strict control of the Americans. Its programming frequently featured jazz music, a genre that was immensely popular on the other side of the Pacific, and was quickly embraced by the Japanese. Food habits changed as well, as fast food like hamburgers, hot dogs, and omelettes, which had been considered delicacies during the Meiji and Taisho eras, were now cheap and easily available. Now, from all this, I don't want to create the impression that Japan only passively imported culture from the US and created none of their own, because that's just not true. Due to the high unemployment and poverty in the early years after the war, pre-war picture card shows were revived by artists who struggled to make ends meet. A narrator would use large, hand-drawn cards to tell his stories to children. These shows fell into decline after 1955, as they couldn't compete with the tremendously popular cinema and the new medium that had entered Japan two years earlier, the television. But, and there's always a but, exploiting the economic miracle of the 1950s, the picture card artists returned to drawing comics and cartoons that now world-famous manga and anime. Manga in particular gained popularity among Japanese teenagers and college students who would borrow them from lending libraries. Some people became so enamored with them that they would even read 100 per month. As the television channels were usually controlled by their parents, manga became their citadel of freedom. In real ironic fashion, more than half of Japan's cinemas were destroyed during the war, yet the vast majority of the studios survived unscathed. A number of films were released during this early post-war period, with Soyokaze becoming the first post-war hit. And otaku were born. For many scholars, the year 1955 is a turning point for Japan, and marked the real beginning of a post-post-war period. As I've already mentioned in a previous episode, the 1950s was a period of economic recovery for Japan, the so-called Japanese economic miracle. This resulted in the formation of mass culture in Japan through television, manga, and the film industry. Cartoons and comics were not something new to Japan, with the first manga magazine having been published in 1874. However, this was on an entirely different scale. By the 1970s, manga would amount to 20% of total publications produced in Japan. These early comic artists, mangakas, were also influenced by the comics and Disney films that American soldiers had brought with them during the occupation. Their drawings blew away Japanese youth so much that they spiked controversies between scholars as to the nature of the mass and popular culture and complaints from university professors who didn't want their students to read comics. It should be noted here that before the war, there were no female cartoonists in Japan, but after the war, as the suffrage movement became widespread and women enjoyed more liberties than in the past, there was a steady rise in the number of female mangakas. So I just mentioned that the television was introduced in Japan in 1953. In the early days, there were few devices, mainly in tea parlors and big restaurants. However, by 1960, half of Japanese households were equipped with this new medium, which would completely outshine the film industry. 
Taiga dramas, year-long historical dramas that were broadcast by NHK, expressed a national feeling, something that in post-war Japan could not be achieved by more overtly patriotic means. Think of something like The Magnificent Century, but with less Sultana Huram. NHK also organized an annual song contest that would turn into a major national symbol. But it was not only Japanese dramas that were broadcast. The American way of life that was portrayed in American TV series fascinated the Japanese, especially the younger generations, who began to consider it as a utopian goal. Commodities and consumer luxuries like a refrigerator, a vacuum cleaner, a washing machine, and of course a family car became a must-have for any Japanese who wanted to achieve their dream of living life like a typical American. This fetishism for electrical appliances was the expression of a desire to belong to the emerging middle class. By that time, and largely thanks to television and movies, American culture had penetrated deeply into Japanese society and was present everywhere from jazz and rock music, pinball machines, soft drinks, and fast food restaurants. Young Japanese would almost religiously follow fashion and hairstyle trends set by Hollywood. Importantly, these changes were not limited to the urban centers of the time. Factories, car outlets, and concrete buildings sprawled everywhere, transforming the countryside and assimilating it into the national metropolitan society. As incoming Western culture integrated itself into Japan, this new Japanese culture was itself being exported to the West, spearheaded by manga, anime, and a new wave of the Japanese cinematography. To this day, Akira Kurosawa's Seven Samurai ranks as one of the best films ever made. But it's the Kaiju Aiga monster films that have had perhaps the greatest impact on popular culture. Who doesn't recognize the radioactive anti-hero Godzilla? First appearing on the big screen in 1954, Godzilla stood as a metaphor for the atomic bombs, or even maybe the United States, expressing the fear the Japanese held for the death and terror these weapons of mass destruction would bring. The memories of Hiroshima and Nagasaki were still alive in the nation's memory, as less than a decade had passed, and the tensions between the global superpowers remained downright frigid. Godzilla and the rest of the monster films quickly took over the rest of the world, and remain popular even today. But you know what? We're going to bring you a special Gojira episode soon, so stay tuned. We hope that you've enjoyed today's episode, but to make sure you don't miss all of our future episodes, please make sure you subscribe to our channel and have assimilated the positive influences of the bell button into your own unique culture. You know what? Just press the bell button. We can be reached via email at thecoldwarchannel at gmail.com, and we're active on Facebook and Instagram at The Cold War TV. If you enjoy our work, please consider supporting us via www.patreon.com slash the Cold War or through YouTube membership. And don't forget, the trouble with the Cold War is that it doesn't take too long before it gets heated.